Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. This is a very special event, actually, for us. It's the second in a series on uh, Mother Seton celebrating his uh, her 200th uh, anniversary. And we had a, a splendid event with, uh, with students. That was the first one. And this is the second one with faculty. And the third one will have a major speaker on campus. So it's really uh, something to think about. We started with students. Yes, of course, you know, Mother Seton was an educator and we are following, you know, her, um, uh, her vision and her mission uh, in educating generations of Seton Hall students and, uh, you know, showcasing the work of our wonderful students. It gave me an enormous amount of pride. Mm -hmm. And now there is a second treasure that we have and it's, of course, you know, our wonderful, wonderful faculty. And of course, you know, we are doing all these events following harvesting our treasures, which is a kind of a motto of the strategic plan. And of course, two of these treasures are our students and our faculty, our exceptional faculty. So I'm very grateful to faculty. I'm very grateful to the, to the committee that we have worked so hard, you know, to, uh, to bring this, uh, these activities uh, together and make also these activities part of the charter day that, uh, that my colleague, Professor Landrau will talk about uh, later. Uh, before we start, we really, really need some prayer. And uh, we have a very special um, priest and also faculty member in, uh, in the core, right? Mm -hmm. Father Carlos Briceno. Did I say your, uh, the name right, Father? If he is Italian, yes. Briceno, okay. Italian, in Spanish, Briceno. Briceno, okay. Yeah, we go for all. Yeah, <laughs> please, Father. Okay, let's put ourselves in the, in the presence of the Lord. Um, Elizabeth Ann Seaton, wife, mother, foundress, saint, her steadfast fidelity, unwavering hope, a stupid ability to trust in her own experiences, make it a woman for our times and for her own. Faith lifts at the soul on one side, hope supports it on the other. Experience says, it must be, love says, let it be. That herd immunity to the old virus. Only one blessing in the spirit of Elizabeth open our eyes to the sacredness of all that we shall encounter on this journey. Holy, make us whole. Help us love you and each other. Fill us with the wideness of your mercy that lovingly embraces us all. Help us to grow in wisdom and grace and the goodness of the ages. We pray in Jesus' his name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father, for that beautiful prayer. And I would last, like to ask everybody just to mute their microphones. I don't want, you know, to impose my muting from afar to you people. So please do mute your microphones. And then when we open that for, uh, for the, the floor for discussion, you are more, of course, you know, you are going to unmute yourselves. So please double check, you know, so we are all on now. So again, I'm very, very happy to have uh, everybody here. And I see, you know, our dear friends from, uh, from Seton Hall, but also many people from abroad. Uh, I see also members of the Board of Regents and Trustees, and I'm very grateful for that, uh, that they always stick, you know, with, uh, with uh, all this mission, Catholic mission related uh, events that we have, uh, as is the case today. So I will uh, introduce uh, my dear colleague and friend, Professor uh, Maribel Landrau. Uh, she is uh, uh, the Assistant Director of the Corps. And at the same time, Professor Landrau uh, teaches for both the core and also Catholic studies. And um, uh, she has been you know, part of, uh, of the core since the inception of the core, I believe, teaching core one and core two. And later on, uh, Professor Landrau 
is teaching core three classes. And one of the classes actually that she's currently, currently teaching uh, has to do with women. And one of the women, of course, is, uh, is Mother Seaton. Uh, Professor Landrau. And I wanted to mention also that Professor Landrau uh, and also uh, Professor Deloiser, you are both part of the charter committee, right? And our event is part of the, of the, of the charter, uh, charter events of the, of the university. So Professor Landrau, if you can say a few things about the charter. Um, yes, please. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to be here tonight to listen to some of my colleagues who I admire a lot reflecting in Mother Seton. Sister Bosco, which I lovingly call her mom. She's my spiritual mom. Um, Dr. Delosier, who I reach out to him every time I need something from the library, especially this past year teaching Monsignor Fay. So he's always there helping me. Dr. Chagnik, my dear Dr. Chagnik, I'm gonna put you in the spot again. Dr. Chechnik was my professor for American History I and American History II. At that time, I was taking that class at 5.30. And let me tell you something. I did not fall asleep. This professor is just like a bright light in the classroom. Um, but anyway, let's, let's, however, I, before I introduce the ladies, which I don't know if you were here last week, they were my student rock stars. They presented on Mother Seton. Um, Dr. Musaku um, had asked me to talk a little bit about Charter Day, which is March 25th at four o'clock. And I had asked Giselle, Giselle, can you please post this link in the chat room for us? Okay, and as I was getting preparing for this, I went out into the website and I took a quote from the website from Charter Day that it, it says what really Seton Hall is and quote, since its founding, Seton Hall has made and continues to make moral education a priority of the first rank and quote. That, my friends, is what makes this institution different. The education that our students receive based on the Catholic intellectual, moral values, ethic values. So that's what makes us really different. Now, Beauty Charter Day or charter events, it's what um, the Seton Hall community, it offers a time to reflect in the university's rich history, um, but it also commemorates the granting of a charter to Seton Hall College by the state of New Jersey in 1861. And I'm getting, stepping in here in Alan's um, footsteps, but I did my research and during Charter Day again, March 25th, um, four o'clock, we also recognize individuals within the staff, administration, and faculty for the continuing commitment and service to our Setonian community. These um, individuals and recipients of the Bishop Bernard J. McQuaid Medal for Distinguished Service, which is an honor for someone to receive this medal. Why? Because Bishop McQuaid was the first university president. For those of my students that maybe didn't know that, he was the first university president. At the same time, we recognize recipients of the President's Award for student service as well as Seton Hall Servant Leader Scholars. So Charter Day not only is, is recognizing, looking into the university history, especially Mother Seton, but we are recognizing our own people. With that said, I'm gonna leave my ladies to take over the floor. Giselle, Bridget, and Kate, 
um, they're going to um, introduce our faculty and she, they will also moderate the Q&A. So ladies, the floor is yours. Make me proud, no pressure. Good evening, everyone. My name is Giselle Pineda. I'm currently a junior with a double major in biology and Catholic studies here at CN Hall. And it is with great honor and pleasure that I introduce the first panelist of the evening, Sister Mary John Bosco Amakwe. Sister Bosco, as we lovingly call her, is a member of the Congregation of the, family, of the Holy Family Sisters. She taught in the College of Communication and the Arts for 10 years. She is currently an adjunct professor for the University Core Curriculum. Sister Bosco received her doctorate in Communication and Sociology from the Gregorian University in Rome. Now please join me in giving Sister Bosco a warm welcome. I am mute myself. Yeah, thank you very much, Giselle. Oh, hi, hey, baby, for introducing Maria me. Sample. Took him so, there. am I on now? And the new administration power. Um, that it slowly we see some of those relations that were built up begin to erode. <laughs> yeah, I would like to share. Uh, my uh, my uh, my presentation on the PowerPoint. Um, need to get it. So my presentation will be on um, the legacies of mother sitting, but from um, our, our international perspective, our international perspective because. Um, because of uh, the nature of mother's uh, life and mission too. And then as I embraced this since I came to the United States, especially sitting hall, that is why I use uh, legacies in plural because of uh, this many um, aspects. I don't know, do you see my, do you see my PowerPoint? Yes, yes I see it. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. So, uh, in, in to begin with, I, I have to, I want to uh, begin with the quote that summarizes um, that uh, everything about mother and why she's um, uh, she's um, she has um, um, inspired me since I came to this uh, to this university. Uh, sit down, uh, sit indeed more. This is from the uh, Bishop of uh, Baltimore, where mother worked in 1852. Sitting did more for the church in America uh, than all us bishops together. Then the next one is from the homily given by Pope uh, Paul VI on the day uh, mother was uh, canonized. Uh, Elizabeth Ann Sitting is a saint. We make this solemn declaration before the Holy Catholic Church, before other Christian brethren in the world, before the entire American people, and before all humanity. This aspect of humanity is where I fit in. So mother, um, my form of introduction, mother um, uh, sitting, um, I didn't know, even though her feast is being celebrated, universally in the church every uh, January 4th, 4th. But I never heard about mother sitting until I got here in 2008. And that was the, I got to sit in hall and that was the year too, I came to the United States. And uh, thanks to my baby, Mary Bell, when I walked into, uh, into the university because I was looking for a Catholic university and I walked into the uh, into sitting hall. She was the first person I met. When I asked about the uh, Department of Communication, and they told me, go to that building and you go to the basement. So as soon as I came to the basement, I was walking through the hall. And here she, she was. I said, I introduced myself. Oh, sister, welcome. I introduced myself. And I was as I was introducing, I was giving her my resume. And then she looked at my resume and she said, 
Oh, wow, sister, you graduated from Rome, Gregorian. We need you here. And that is why uh, since I've been here since 2008. So, and uh, one of the first stories, short, simple, I had about mother sitting is uh, that she was aunt to Bishop, uh, Bell, uh, Bishop Belly, who was the Bishop of Newark. And that uh, the um, um, high school, Catholic school in his diocese, when it was elevated to uh, the status of a university by the, by the state, uh, Bishop Bailey decided to name uh, the institution uh, after uh, his aunt, uh, um, Elizabeth and Seton. So that is the short and simple story I had about her. So, but uh, as I, I start to get used to knowing the compound, the campus, anywhere I go, her statues will greet me. I see her all over. But the three places that are touched the statue, uh, the, her statue really kind of spoke to me. I was in the big chapel, Immaculate Conception Chapel, the little chapel in Xavier, and the big one in front of the Jubilee Hall. So, I mean, it's like the gaze is right on me. And what I see, I read from the face, I read the face of um, a pretty woman, determined, strong. Um, um, she's always with a book. I said, wow, I mean, a book can be interpreted to be anything. It can be the Bible, it can be, uh, the rule of life, uh, rule of life for her congregation. It can be the breviary, the, the prayer book for priests and nuns. And now prayer for the faithful, everybody can use that book now. And it can be any book. These are, I mean, I, I will always pause and reflect on, on her and the, her composure. The next thing uh, that uh, will always speak to me when I look at her statue is she was always with a rosary. And this rosary, I will always, I will always say to myself, I, I think the, being devoted to the Virgin Mary, the mother of Christ, is another way that mother identified herself with another, modeled her own life after another strong woman that uh, uh, from generation to generation is celebrating as a strong woman. So these are the reflections um, that will always, um, um, that I always uh, ponder whenever I look at the statue of uh, Mother City. And then with that kind of you know, interest, I started to read. I said, there must be something more than just being an aunt and being named, uh, the university being named after her. Let me, let me, uh, I am a woman advocate. I, I, I want to know more about you know, great women. So I started researching on her. And uh, the first book I found from the library uh, was the one, um, Elizabeth City in American Saint. I started reading, reading, and it was also written by uh, Catherine O'Donnell, a member of her order. And they are you know, all female, female, female touch and the expressions and everything in that book really uh, engulfed me with uh, our love for Mother City. So um, in the semester of uh, last year, spring semester uh, for the journey of transformation class, since we, we can change uh, the optional readings, you can choose any reading of your interest. I said the life of this woman really touched me and is saying a lot. Let me uh, recommend it for my students. And I included it in my syllabus for uh, that, um, uh, that semester. And uh, I was amazed the, the, the impact she had on me when I read the book is almost the same. When we had the class discussions, uh, the, day we, the day we had, in fact, we had yeah, two days are the two chapters because they were long chapters and I tried to take time to explore them. So we had two new classes of that uh, book. So the class discussions are from the students, especially the girls, 
is like, wow, wow, wow. So, and when I read also their journal entries, it was all amazing. Then I knew a couple of them, two or three girls wrote their first paper on mother city, which one of them, Jacqueline's paper, I treasure that very well because of uh, how she identified with mother. And that is also what I want to do because like my students did, mother's life was a kind of mirror of my own life in so many ways. And I tried to, uh, she was a woman of many firsts. She was a foundress. She was a professed religious, a spiritual mother, an educator, an intellectual. Uh, you will see she read a lot. And the most important thing now, she was an interfaith champion. She was devoted to St. Joseph. Her work with the poor, especially girls, was uh, first of its kind. And she was also an immigrant. She experienced this uh, discrimination and she was a patriot. So these are the areas I'm going to um, look at quickly. Uh, I think we have how many minutes? 15. I will have to rush um, um, the presentation. So the first thing is uh, as a foundress, we know that mother founded uh, one of the uh, famous and the first um, women religious congregation in the United States in Emmysburg in Maryland, the Sisters of Charity of St. Joseph. Um, and their uh, rule of life also was modeled uh, according to the spirituality of the Sisters of Charity in France, uh, founded by St. Vincent de Paul and uh, St. Louis de uh, Marillac. It is amazing. And uh, this is one, when I was reading all this, since I said, wow, this is a perfect identification with me. Uh, in 1983, my own founder then had the inspiration from what he told us uh, to begin a female congregation. According to the spirit of St. Vincent de Paul, exactly that's what he said. And why? Because the, he wanted a congregation that would take care of the poor and they need the especially poor girls. Um, and that is how uh, St. Vincent uh, de Paul is now listed as one of our, our patron saints. Mother married um, uh, um, uh, at, uh, in, on January, uh, mother got married to William Seaton on January 25th, uh, um, 1790. <laughs> Seventeen ninety four, and uh, that's exactly the very day, um, the very day I was accepted in the convent, in the congregation, the new congregation, as one of the founding members. That was the very day I entered. I was received into the postulancy, the first formation stage to become a religious. So when I read this, I said, "This is my uh, mother." This is my woman. Another thing that is very striking as a founder is all that mother went through when she was founding her own order, fundraising, meeting people. This is all that we did, uh, especially myself with the founder to make sure that our congregation was founded. And when we had no money, initially we had no money to do nothing. We were doing everything, the construction, we were the stone mansions, we, did, we were the handy women of construction and building our congregation. So this is all that mother did too. So um, our, ours, like mother's congregation, ours also is the first uh, order that was founded to take care of this, uh, to do this kind of work, taking care of abuse and abandoned teenage pregnant girls and their babies. And ours was the first pro-life uh, congregation in Nigeria. This next identification with mother uh, was uh, being a professed religious. Uh, you know, by professing the three vows, mother uh, became a mother sitting. That's Elizabeth and uh, became mother sitting. Already we know her life. She was a, a deep spiritual woman, uh, was influential to her daughters and other women. But by professing it, by becoming a religious, 
mother, that, that particular profession elevated mother's role as a spiritual mother, I would say universally as we know her today. And uh, me too, that um, the three evangelical vows is what we take. That is after you pronounce them, then you are known as a professed religious poverty, chastity and obedience. And my own mother made her own vows on March 25th, 1809. And I made mine in December 12th, 1888. Uh, since then too, uh, uh, Mary Bell, well, that's what she knows me for. As a spiritual mom, I try my best, beginning with my sisters in the community and wherever I am. I mean, I wear it on me as a, um, the role of a spiritual mom. Then comes uh, the title as, um, as an intellectual educator. We know that uh, she, um, she, the introduction also Dr. Musaku made. She is known uh, as one of the greatest educators of her time. Uh, but before then, uh, as a young woman, Elizabeth Ann read European philosophy. After her conversion, she read everything about the Catholic, almost everything that she laid hand on about the Catholic uh, teachings. She also read about uh, teachings of um, other saints. Uh, especially saints from uh, uh, Africa, like Augustine and many from Spain. Uh, with homeschooling of her own uh, children uh, and the foundation of the first uh, um, uh, female um, and parochial school in the United States, Mother Sitting became one of the greatest educators of her time. Uh, this is another, another uh, aspect of her that I identify very much with. Our uh, education, especially for girls, is my interest. Uh, I advocate for um, girls empowerment through education, especially in Africa. And my motto is always education is power. Uh, when we give them that, uh, uh, um, that arm, it will help them to develop, the, uh, the, it will help our continent to move forward. Uh, since I've been here in the US, I try to look out for sponsorship and for help educational wise. Uh, for example, I, since uh, 2017, I partner with a school in Bernersville in, in New Jersey, uh, and they are helping a school in, in the northern part of Nigeria, especially where girls are stopped from going to school, St. Patrick's. It's a Catholic school that is board, it's a boarding school for for both boys and girls and miss interfaith too. And so, and I've been working hard to help uh, the bishop be up there to make sure that the students, they have a little of scholarship to keep them in school. Also, my passion for education is the reason why I'm here at Seton Hall. I love books. And that's why a mother holding book all the time was, was, was something that, uh, uh, that um, I can identify with easily. I always have a lot of books all over. And now I dream, my, one of my projects and one of my dream is to make sure to find a way of building an open uh, free library for women in Nigeria in order to help them uh, cultivate the culture of reading. The interfaith aspect of mother uh, sitting also was very striking to me. For example, she was born in an Anglican family and uh, her, um, uh, her grandfather was uh, an Anglican uh, minister, uh, Richard Charlton. As uh, a girl, she was listening to Methodist hymns. Um, in her teenage years also, mother was influenced by the Protestant uh, tradition of uh, centered on Bible reading. And as an adult, she embraced, uh, she converted to Catholicism. Then her conversion also influenced other members of her family. For example, her nephew uh, who became the Bishop of, uh, of Newark was a former Episcopalian minister and he uh, converted, became a priest and then, and then the Bishop of Newark. And then one of the sister-in-laws, um, Rebecca Mary uh, Sitting, uh, who was described as uh, uh, mother's uh, so uh, the soul sister of uh, Elizabeth Bailey sitting are uh, converted with her. Another uh, sister-in-law, um, 
Catherine Seaton not only converted, but herself joined the first uh, American, it became the first American to join the uh, Irish uh, Sisters of Mercy. Uh, so this is also uh, just a kind of a replica to my own story. For example, my mom was born and raised a Methodist. She converted and became a Catholic when she married my dad. And she brought with her the that uh, Protestant culture of uh, uh, Bible school. And she, even though she was an, uh, an, an uh, she wasn't educated, but she was reading the Bible in her local language and was sharing it with the women in the parish. And uh, she was known for that until in my family presently, we have at least seven different Christian denominations and we all get along well, uh, like mother did. Also this interfaith uh, aspect of, uh, of uh, mother is what I see in the courses I teach, like uh, the journey of transformation and uh, Christianity and culture in dialogue. This interfaith and, in, and interdisciplinary nature of these courses, that is what really uh, that helps me to enjoy uh, the, the, the courses very much. Mother cared for the poor. That is one of the things we know her for. Uh, the most of her time she devoted it, uh, in, uh, in taking care of the less privileged. Uh, for example, in um, 1897, uh, uh, she and other women, they found, formed the, uh, the first uh, charitable organization in, uh, in the New York area, uh, the Society for the Relief of Poor Widows and Small Children. And she later became the, uh, the treasurer of that um, organization for seven years. Uh, this is also, I belong to uh, another founded by, for the same, uh, we do the same work mother do, mother did, and the, the sisters, uh, the um, sisters of charity are still doing. Uh, we do family apostolate, provide families with their basic human needs. Uh, um, she built orphanages and uh, we have at least four orphanage in Nigeria in different parts that we, uh, we take care of uh, uh, orphans. Um, widows in Africa, they go through a lot of abuse and deprivation because of the culture and the cultural rituals. Our sisters take care of these people, these widows, especially uh, during the time they call the mourning uh, period when they, they are isolated from everybody. Uh, we, we take care of them and their kids at times. We take their children uh, to, to our centers to keep them until the period is over when they cannot have access to their kids. I was also, it happened that I was also the first secretary general of my order that I was doing. I did that for three years. So as an immigrant, sorry to interrupt. Um, just to give you a heads up, you have about a minute left to just wrap oh, up. Okay. You. So as an immigrant, we know that a little, uh, we know that mother uh, um, uh, migrated uh, to Italy with her uh, family. Uh, apart from the, that the parents were, grandparents were immigrants to the United States, but mother traveled around even within the United States. And the same thing too, I mean, uh, uh, after my profession, I went to Europe for studies and here now, I went around the, uh, some of the countries in Africa, and now I am in the United States. The last bit of mother's uh, aspect that, uh, that I get consolence from is her experience, uh, she dis uh, experienced discrimination, especially when she converted to Catholicism and when she lost her as a widow too in the United States. And even she contemplated moving to Canada. That's all I have had it all. In, in, uh, in Ireland, I was, oh, I didn't know that African girls can become nuns. Uh, uh, you, you, do you have houses? Everything, you have accent. Where is it coming from? All that, even now, I am greeted with a Muslim greeting, Salam Aleikum, even though I wear crucifix that shows that I, I am a Christian and I a nun. But I experienced all these things. Mother was truly an American. We know that. And uh, all this put together, I, um, 
I identify her devotion to St. Joseph. And uh, I must conclude that we are celebrating mother in a month that is very particular to her. Apart from her colonization also happened on the year uh, the UN declared it to be uh, Women's Year uh, uh, 1975. But here we are in March celebrating women and remembering mother. And we see all the dates, March, that was very uh, particular to her. Uh, March 14th, March 25th, uh, two dates, the same year, she received her Holy Communion. Uh, she made her vows and uh, her beatification also. And by the way, that year was the year I was born. That is another thing that I, I, I identify with mother. So I am concluding with uh, the, the phrase, uh, the statement made by uh, Pope Paul VI on the canonization day, uh, be proud of her and know how to preserve her faithful heritage. That is what we are doing. And I, I will keep this wherever I go. Thank you. Thank you, sister. I believe now Catherine is going to introduce our next panelist. Uh, yes. Good. Oh. No, it's actually me, Giselle. Actually, Bridget uh, Giselle. She's going to introduce. Oh, her. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you so much, Sister Bosco, for your lovely presentation. And thank you for everyone who has gathered here tonight for this special celebration of our dear mother, Seton. My name is Bridget Emerson, a junior public relations major here at Seton Hall, who spoke at the student panel last week. Tonight, it is an honor to welcome our second guest speaker, Dr. Alan Delosier. Dr. Alan Delosier currently serves as the university archivist at the Seton Hall University and executive director of the New Jersey Catholic Historical Commission. He received his doctorate in Irish studies at Drew University. Please welcome Dr. Alan Delosier. Great. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Ms. Emerson, Bridget. I appreciate it. And um, it's a real great honor to be with everybody here tonight. Um, and I just wanna thank Sister um, Mary John Bosco for a very inspired conversation and discussion about how Mother Seton speaks to her. And what I'm gonna do over the next few moments, and my apologies, um, I'm trying to put up my PowerPoint here. Um, let's see. I'm used to. Dr. Delosier, um, can I interrupt you two seconds? Oh yeah, absolutely. Sister Bosco, can you stop sharing your screen so Dr. Oh. Delosier could just share his, I'm sorry. No, no, and now I know. Oh, and my, my apologies. Thank you so I'm much, not sister. Used to Thank Zoom. you. I like team. Better. Sister Bosco, in, mm -hmm. in the bottom between where it says chat and mm -hmm. record, that's mm -hmm. where should be your your you should stop your shared screen. Yeah, that's did you get it? No. Okay. Is it still on? Oh, si yeah. sister, if you go down as a Professor Landro mentioned, if you go down to the toolbar oh, okay. at the bottom, yep, share screen. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Okay, so if you just give me a moment here. Okay. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Wonderful, thank you so much, everybody. And again, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here tonight. And uh, the title of my uh, presentation is called Preserving the Life and Legacy of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Print. But I also added an addendum and beyond because I know we're in this time of COVID and so forth. What I'm gonna do is channel not only Mother Seton and her stories and also the resources that really reflect around her example and how she's really educated 
not only scores of generations in the past, but even the current generation. And I have to praise all the speakers last week. That panel discussion was excellent. And it shows that there's such a passion and such an excitement for the life of Mother Seton among our students here today. And also myself, um, I should have mentioned my bio. I'm a proud member and adjunct of the Catholic Studies uh, program, where I teach the uh, class entitled New Jersey Catholic Experience, where we talk about patron saints connected to the state of New Jersey. And Mother Seton is foremost and prominent among them. So it's a real pleasure to be here and talk more about uh, Mother Seton. But I'll also channel as an archivist and librarian, St. Jerome and St. Lawrence as well. So without any further ado, I'm gonna get started and show you a few uh, slides here. And I'll apologize if this looks like a commercial message for resources that we work with, but really it's channeling Mother Seed in terms of her example about education, especially being the uh, patron of American Catholic parochial education and just enlightening and bringing more knowledge to our base, not only here at school, but across the uh, nation and across the world. Anyway, with that said, just some thoughts in terms of um, research. I look at research from any perspective because there's programs dealing with Mother Seton's example, uh, especially at Emmitsburg for K to 12 uh, age range, which is great. That's starting out with simple exercises about what Mother Seton was all about, who she was and all these great factors. And as Sister uh, Mary John Bosco mentioned, she has some great biographical information along with how she inspired as well. So as you can see here, and please forgive me if this is sort of repetitious for some folks. Um, let me see if I can come up here. I may have put this on a timer. Anyway, um, in terms of biographies and uh, various other treatments going back in time to the 19th century, all the way up to the present, you got to keep in mind the tone, who the author was and the style of historical scholarship that was in mind. But this is all good because it gives you sort of like a, um, a vision or a view into um, the time periods and it can be used as one of those tools to look at how Mother Seton was treated by different generations, but also looking at different things. Librarians think a different way. We think about the resources used and then trying to promote where they're from. So bibliographies, endnotes, footnotes, primary and secondary sources. And for those of you who aren't familiar with primary sources, they're basically letters, manuscripts, newspapers, things that are in the first person. Secondary is more biographical information but everything has its place in terms of educating each of us and all those who are set to discover Mother Seton down the road. And I mentioned um, grade school and so forth, but also other types of levels, college, university, for example, I've dealt with graduate students. And you know what the beauty is, I learned a lot from those individuals along with building on the tops of my knowledge of what I've learned already. And I just have to thank too, Dr. Muzako, Dr. Enright, Dr. Jeznik and um, Dr. Landro and others in terms of over the years, they've enlightened me about Mother Seed from various angles as well. So with that said, you know, other individuals, aspects of her life, time periods and so forth. And primary sources also come in the form of illustrations. There's so many of them out there and it's interesting to see what the aesthetic and the artistic interpretation is along with the textual base as well. So. Let's get into some more specifics in terms of Mother Seed and finding those information sources that you may not have discovered before, but again, if it's a repetition, you know, things that can be available to you, you know, either remotely or in person as well. So I just wanna mention again, the COVID aspect and then trying to find information as quickly, as thoroughly and as completely as possible. So this is one of the um, standard um, sources here. Um, the Collected Writings, Sister Regina Bechtel, um, Judith Metz, and, um, and others who were involved in the research as well. Um, I can thank Sister um, Regina Bechtel because she visited our archives a few years ago. And she found a letter from Mother Seton. I'll show you that um, in a few moments. That was written in her hand to her daughter, uh, which constitutes one of our um, prized possessions here in the archives. But with that said, this is something that we're looking at in terms of online versions. Um, but at the same time, in terms of a service here at Seton Hall, we're happy to uh, work with you in terms of digitization and scanning and so forth. So I guess I'm veering back at the commercial message time, but really it's, it's about sharing the education wherever you find it and then, you know, transmitting it and then having it available for you as um, quickly as possible. 
So this is one of the prime sources in terms of primary sources. That's in book form that can be made available to you down the road. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do is get more into some of our websites that are connected. This is what is called a library guide or lib guide. This is one that's, that's been created. Um, I'm sort of the conduit or the messenger, so to speak. And we're always looking to populate with more resources electronically, um, things in our library and things that are external as well. We give equal opportunity to you know, valid sources related to Mother Seton. So the researcher has a one-stop shop, so to speak, in terms of finding materials. And this particular one not only deals with her life, but also internet resources, um, various other you know, connected areas. And we even went one step further in terms of the Americanization. You know, the connections to the Bailey family, of course, James Roosevelt Bailey, his sister, Mary John mentioned about the first Bishop of Newark, and also the Roosevelt family, which has a connection as well, being cousins of the, uh, the Baileys as well. And even going back to Scotland and the Seton family going back generations. So with that said, you know, this is something that we have and the links are at the bottom. And after this presentation, I can make this uh, PowerPoint available if you'd like. You know, no pressures, but we like to have things for reference if, you, if you'd like to uh, resource and uh, access it. Okay, so along with the LibGuide, we also have specialized collections within our archives. Um, I mentioned the letter from Mother Seton, which I'll show you in a moment, but we have other ones that deal with Mother Seton's uh, canonization, the family in terms of uh, the Seton Jevons papers, which happened different generations after Mother Seton passed away over 200 years ago, well, 200 years ago this year and um, others in terms of um, scholars. Sister Marie Celeste, who was a uh, scholar on Mother Seton, we have her index card collection. Remember the days when we had index cards before computers? Very impressive in terms of how she organized her notes and, um, and published from there. So she was a wonderful person to deal with and we have her collection, among various other things, dealing with the uh, Seton family um, legacy within our collection. And here's the letter off to the right-hand side see here. Um, if anybody can read and translate 19th century script, very impressive. I'm always, I'm always in awe of people who can really decipher tremendous, beautiful, cursive writing. But with that said, here are Dr. some of the Allen, questions. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I uh, just to give you a heads up, it's about five more minutes left. You Thank got you. it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Miguel. Okay. Yep. I'm going to go quickly. So that's, that's perfect. Okay. So different uh, collections here. Photos, Bailey Seton League, which was named in honor of Bishop Bailey, Mother Seton, which was a uh, philanthropy, philanthropy group in the 1940s that helped in terms of scholarships and helping Seton Hall students out. Um, so as we go down, I'll go a little bit quicker. And I also want to, um, again, praise the uh, students, um, each of you who gave a presentation last week, Giselle, Bridget, and Catherine, and also, uh, Professor Landro for the tremendous opportunity to learn more about Mother Seton from your own respective uh, perspectives. And then here's the uh, Seton Shrine. Um, basically Emmitsburg is the epicenter of Mother Seton materials. And their website is really well done, well-crafted and user-friendly. So there's a lot of access points on there that are worth checking out uh, down the road. Okay, now here's a resource that's really great, Hathi Trust. We've just upgraded our subscription through the library. They have all these older books that are out of copyright and you can find a lot of materials on this thing that are really obscure and really neat in terms of um, content and um, finding things that are sort of off the beaten path, so to speak. And again, I'll have this in the PowerPoint if you want to access it or you can ask me any questions afterward. Okay, so we're almost towards, towards the end. So thanks for the heads up. Archive Grid. This tells you a little bit about uh, manuscript collections that deal with Mother Seton and family members. It has a great search box. It's very uh, user-friendly. And just in my one look, I looked at materials. Of course, the main ones are in Emmitsburg, some here at Seton Hall, and um, of course, the wonderful schools, Cornell, University of Scranton, Notre Dame, Library of Congress. And New York has a number of different repositories that have Mother Seton materials too. So this is an access point that's really helpful in terms of primary source materials that are really um, helpful in terms of looping together all the access points of Mother Seton out there that have been processed. And of course, our wonderful friends at the College of St. Elizabeth, we deal a lot with them and they're tremendous, the Sisters of Charity, Mother Seton's group. 
Um, they have a number of materials in the Sisters of Charity collection and their college archives as well. So it's a really great place and the Mahoney Library is the access point for anything from a local perspective. And that's me. And I just want to thank you very much for your time, attention, and it's a great honor and pleasure to be with everybody here today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. DeLazer. Um, so now Catherine will be introducing our third and final panelist, Dr. Chechnik. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Kate Wasson and I'm a senior political science Catholic studies double major. And it is my honor to introduce Dr. Th Thomas Chechnik, an associate professor of history at Seton Hall and co-editor of the quarterly journal, American Catholic Studies. He regularly teaches courses in American Catholic history for the history department, Catholic studies, and the university core. Dr. Chechnik holds a doctoral degree in history from Notre Dame University. He is currently working on a history of St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City. St. Vincent's Hospital was established in 1849 by the Sisters of Charity, the religious order founded by Elizabeth Ann Seton. St. Vincent's was the third oldest and first Catholic hospital to serve New York City. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chechnik. Thanks so much, Kate, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to Sister Bosco and Alan. Alan, talking about primary sources, you're speaking right to historian's heart. So I'm happy to be with you this evening to talk about the doctor's daughter, Mother Seton's legacy in healthcare. As I thought about what to say about Mother Seton's legacy in healthcare, I was tempted to be a little tongue in cheek and say that this would be an exceptionally short talk. Mother Seton herself never engaged in any formal healthcare ministry, nor did her sisters establish any hospitals during her lifetime, although they did help staff the infirmary at nearby Mount St. Mary's Seminary as part of their domestic uh, services to the college. Their primary work lay in education and childcare. It was not until two years after Mother Seton's death that members of her religious community formally engaged in healthcare ministry when several Sisters of Charity were invited to take charge of the Baltimore Infirmary. Having never undertaken such work before, the community's annals know, quote, everything was new to them. But such a dismissal would be anachronistic since formal health care as we know it today did not exist in Mother Seton's time. Tending to the sick was simply part of domestic labor. It was part of the skill set that all women were expected to possess. Mother Seton understood this well. She cared valiantly for her husband when he was suffering from tuberculosis, including during their confinement in a cold, damp lazaretto, a quarantine prison in Italy, where ironically they had gone in the hope of securing health and healing. As a mother, she tended to her children, two of whom died during childhood. And as the spiritual mother of her community, she buried 18 of her fellow sisters. She knew all too well the immense physical and emotional labor that went into caring for the sick and the dying. As one biography noted, quote, illness, sorrow, and early death were omnipresent in Elizabeth's life. She also knew the struggle of illness firsthand from her own tuberculosis, the disease that would claim her life at age 42. In the years and decades that followed, memory of her experience and her example would live on within her religious community. Caring for the sick was an integral part of the work of charity to which they, and Mother Seton herself, had dedicated their lives. I'm gonna just quickly share my screen with everybody. Trust everybody can see that. It's an honor to be asked to offer some reflection on Mother Seton's legacy in healthcare as we mark the 200th anniversary of her death. For the past several years, I've been researching the history of St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City, an institution that was founded by the Sisters of Charity of New York, a branch of the original community founded by Mother Seton in Emmitsburg, Maryland. The, uh, the slide that you should have here shows the, the first uh, building that the hospital occupied in 1849. 
And then the second image is the way the hospital looked in 1965 after its post-World War II expansion. So you can see how dramatically the institution had grown in a little over a century. The title of this talk was borrowed from a booklet that was produced by the hospital to celebrate the opening of its new medical research building in 1963. The book called attention to Mother Seton as the doctor's daughter. Uh, it celebrated Seton's own New York City roots and her family history in medicine. Her father, Richard Bailey, was a public health officer and the first professor of anatomy at King's College, today's Columbia University. The booklet asserts that it was from him that Mother Seton learned, quote, the care of the sick and the tragedy of disease. As a brief aside, you can see um, that the booklet includes an image of Mother Seton. Curiously, Mother Seton was rarely mentioned in the hospital's publicity materials prior to this time, the 1950s and 1960s. And the hospital did not rename its main building in her honor until 1959. So she really wasn't present um, in a significant way in the hospital. It was only in the 1950s and the 1960s that she sort of reemerged with more force, and the timing of that was not coincidental. It was part of a deliberate effort to place St. Vincent within, quote, the length and shadow of Mother Seton, following the opening of her cause for canonization in 1957. As a result, the sisters wanted to make sure that all of their accomplishments were rightly credited to her example. Um, and for more on the history of Mother Seton's canonization, tune in for the third speaker in our series. Uh, we're going to have Professor Kathleen Cummings from the University of Notre Dame speaking on Mother Seton's cause. Um, so back to the issue of Mother Seton's legacy in healthcare. Uh, but first, one disclaimer. In Catholic circles, legacy has often been measured in terms of numbers. Parishes built, converts gained, children educated. This has been the case in Catholic healthcare too. Popular accounts like to emphasize how more than 600 Catholic sisters served as nurses during the Civil War, making up a sizable portion of the nursing corps on both sides of the conflict. Other accounts like to point to institutional accomplishments, calling attention to the fact that Catholic sisters were responsible for establishing hundreds of hospitals and other healthcare facilities across the United States during the 19th and 20th centuries, making the Catholic Church the largest single sponsor of not-for-profit healthcare in the country to this day. It's an impressive accomplishment. And Mother Seton's spiritual daughters, the sisters and the daughters of charity played a major role in that history. In looking beyond numbers, I'd like to encourage us to think more about how the sisters lived out the work of charity. So let me turn to three brief examples, three commitments that reveal the part of, that reveal part of Mother Seton's remar remarkable legacy in healthcare. First, a commitment to the poor. To me, St. Vincent's is important, not just because it was the first Catholic hospital in New York City, Rather, its importance lay in the mission and principles that guided its work. The hospital was founded in 1849, when a small band of sisters under the leadership of Sister Angela Hughes rented a townhouse and opened its doors to the sick. St. Vincent's was the first hospital in the city dedicated to the care of the sick with no, finan with no financial means of their own, regardless of race, creed, or color. That in and of itself was a radical policy statement at a time when the two, only two other options available to the sick were either the squalid public hospital at Bellevue or the elite New York hospital for those who could afford private care. The sisters maintained that all who came to them in need would be received and that the poor were no less deserving of the best care than those who could pay. It was recognition of their fundamental dignity. Other voluntary hospitals chose who they wanted to serve, regularly shutting their doors to the poor. 
The sisters, however, never turned anyone away. That principle became a hallmark of Catholic healthcare in the United States and one of its most distinctive legacies. Through their example, Catholic sisters pushed society to recognize that healthcare was a right and that all, including and especially the poor, were deserving of equal care and treatment. Now, what happens when an institution's live, an institution lives by a policy of not turning anyone away? I'd like to turn now to the 1980s and St. Vincent's response to the AIDS crisis. So second, a commitment to care. Given its location in Greenwich Village, the heart of the city's gay community, St. Vincent's found itself at the epicenter of the AIDS crisis when it emerged in the 1980s. At that time, when there were no effective treatments or cure for the disease, St. Vincent's responded the only way possible, with care and compassion. Among those who stood out for their example was Sister Patrice Murphy, coordinator of the hospital's hospice program. And she's pictured there with uh, artist Andy Warhol from one of the fundraising events that the hospital sponsored. As the number of AIDS patients at St. Vincent's began to swell, she refocused the program in 1983 to help respond to their unique needs, establishing one of the first dedicated AIDS hospice programs in the country. She also worked to recruit and train volunteers willing to work with AIDS patients at a time when many were treated as modern day lepers because of uncertainty about the nature of the disease and its transmission. Sister Patrice Dr. recognized- Dr. Chechnik, sorry to interrupt. So you have a little less than five minutes left. Just to let Thank you, you so know. much. Thank you. Sister Patrice recognized the importance of the example she and her program set. Often simple acts of kindness were the most important like offering a hug or being willing to hold a patient's hand. Her work also set an example to those under her care. Many within the gay community were unsure how they would be received by a Catholic institution given the church's teachings. Would they be judged? On the contrary, Sister Patrice's work revealed the power of unconditional love and radical acceptance. It offered an affirmation of their status and moral worth. For those who may have been alienated from the church or from God, her efforts helped to bring another form of healing and reconciliation. As she recalled, if they find a loving, compassionate God, then we've done something worthwhile. But at times, care and compassion alone are not enough. Sometimes ensuring that the needs of the sick and the poor are met requires not just charity, but reform. And so third, I wanna conclude with a commitment to justice. Here, I want to look beyond St. Vincent's and show how Mother Seton's spiritual daughters drew upon their experience in healthcare to advocate for fundamental reform. When the history of the Affordable Care Act is written, I hope that Sister Carol Kean, a member of the Daughters of Charity, receives the attention she deserves. As president and chief executive of the Catholic Health Association, a position that she held from 2005 to 2018. She lobbied on behalf of the legislation and worked to secure its passage. And today we celebrate the 11th anniversary of its passage. Her efforts were especially crucial in securing the support of Catholic legislators. Kean helped convince them that the terms of the Affordable Care Act were consistent with the Catholic Church's teachings. In recognition of her efforts, President Obama gave her one of the commemorative pens he used to sign the legislation. As one member of President Obama's staff said, the Affordable Care Act could not have been enacted had it not been for the tenacity and generosity and talk. grace and determination. Only 28 people, Carol. but she could at least see me. How did Kian find her public voice on the subject? She certainly did not come to healthcare debates as a policymaker. She might not even have people. considered herself an activist. Her career mirrored that of many other women religious of her generation engaged in healthcare. She entered the Daughters of Charity at age 21 after receiving her nursing diploma in 1964. She began as an emergency room nurse and then steadily rose up the ranks of responsibility, just like many other sister administrators had done. 
and she eventually served as president and CEO of Providence Hospital in Washington, DC, before being tapped to lead the Catholic Health Association. For Kean and other women religious like her, her years of personal ministry and experience working within Catholic hospitals and other healthcare institutions gave her authority and credibility as she spoke on behalf of healthcare reform. Sister's history of establishing, administering, and staffing those institutions, combined with their experience of working among the poor and marginalized, gave them distinctive moral authority and political credibility in policy debates. They helped bring a distinctive Catholic voice to bear on healthcare policy and the work of justice in the United States. In conclusion, I hope that my remarks help us appreciate more fully Mother Seton's legacy in healthcare and in society. Following her example, members of her religious community put principles into practice. They served the poor, they modeled compassionate care, and they drew upon their experience to advocate for reform. And in this Women's History Month, it's only fitting to note how figures like Sister Angela Hughes, Sister Patrice Murphy, and Sister Carol Kean, like so many others who carried out the legacy of Mother Seton, demonstrated and modeled women's leadership. Mother Seton would be most proud. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chechnik. That was great. I would also like to take this time to thank Dr. Chechnik, Sister Bosco, and Dr. Deloja for your wonderful presentations. They were very informative and I thoroughly enjoyed them all. So now I'm going to open the floor up to any questions, comments, or anything that you may have. Um, also, please feel free to use the chat if you're not comfortable with unmuting yourself. I would like to start. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so I was kind of uh, writing some notes to myself. Um, you know, when, when I was, uh, I want to first, first begin thanking, thanking you for allowing me to be part of this, uh, this meeting. And I enjoy all the presentations. So after listening all the presentations, uh, my favorite Bible passage came to mind. It's John, John 15, 13. That's my favorite passage. He says, greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. And I kind of uh, think about this passage because as I listen, as I reflected in the, the life of Mother Seton, I can see that she laid her life down for people that probably she didn't even know. And that's for me is a, is a message. You know, anytime I see the, this commandment of love fulfilled, I see holiness. You know, holiness is to give you life. And, and it, that's the meaning of love. The love ultimately is just to give you life and to bear, you know, to bear the difficulties of life to, for the other, you know, to carry the cross for others. And I see Mother Seton, she carried the cross for others. And, and one question that I have, I was thinking also about an, another saint that I like very much, which is Saint Francis of Assisi. And I see that Mother Seton came from a prominent family. You know, she, she probably had a lot of, um, I don't know, luxury in her life. And, uh, but, but how can we compare Mother Seton with St. Francis of Assisi? Is there any relationship that we can see in, in both saints? Thank you so much for that question. I, I'm not necessarily an expert on Mother Seton's full biography, um, but I think your point about sort of the ability to, to engage in, in that degree of, of self-giving is found in them, um, but also many saints in the Catholic uh, tradition. So, I mean, for her very much, it was drawing upon uh, sort of the inspiration of St. Vincent de Paul and St. Louise de Marriac, who, you know, had founded the Sister of Charity. She used them as the basis for her own religious communities um, order, uh, sort of her own sort of constitutions. In, in thinking back her history, you know, I. I honestly don't recall any sort of direct connection between Mother Seton and um, her sort of speaking about or drawing inspiration from St. Francis of Assisi, um, but it certainly could be there. She would have been familiar with reading the lives of saints and he's certainly up there in the, um, you know, sort of in the constellation of notables. Thank you. 
maybe in their service to the poor and you Tom mentioned that you know mother's uh, mission in serving the poor and St. Francis really stood you know for the poor I personally see a connection between the two there Yeah, I mean, sometimes it is when you look at the sort of within healthcare, you know, you often have sort of sisters who are engaged in in very similar ministries, but they will sort of define themselves ever so slightly. Um, so this is kind of getting away from your question. But when, you know, in New York City, the Sisters of Charity established their hospital, Franciscan Sisters established a separate hospital a few years later for German speakers, uh, Mother Cabrini's sisters established a hospital for the Italian community. Um, and there was a bit of a sort of a little bit of a tension when uh, in the 1980s, the Archdiocese of New York looked to merge hospitals together, because even though they were all Catholic hospitals and they were all engaged in uh, serving the poor, when it came to try and reconcile and bring them together, you know, one talked about its commitment to charity. The other one would talk about its Franciscan values. Another one would talk about Cabrini's values. and you know, it was sort of like splitting hairs, but there was just enough nuance in how they understood their own history that it wasn't simple enough to just sort of say, they're all Catholic hospitals. Um, but this is part of the richness of the Catholic tradition where they can draw examples from different strains, different parts of the tradition um, and, and sort of immerse themselves in that same important work. May I direct a um, um, question to Dr. Chechnik, please? Um, Dr. Chechnik, in your research for St. Vincent's, okay, mm -hmm. you mentioned briefly that her name was not mentioned, her history was not mentioned within the, the, the hospital itself. And it was not on the, only until 1959, you mentioned that mm -hmm. her name came up. It was found by the Sisters of Charity, but your research, why is that? Yeah, and there, it's, it's a really curious thing, and I was surprised by it myself. Um, you know, certainly the connection was there through the Sisters of Charity themselves. Um, and so when you look at the early promotional materials from the hospitals, the advertisements that they produced, the booklets, the pamphlets, um, it was very much about the Sisters of Charity um, not Mother Seton, because the reputation, as, as I understand it, um, the reputation of the hospital was built upon the sisters who were there presently, serving as the nurses. They were the representative figure. Um, you know, and often sort of that they didn't want to claim identity for themselves. You know, the sisters were sort of anonymous. They were all interchangeable. They didn't take on specific, you know, their own personal persona. So it might have been part of this way of a work of humility that was simply the sisters did this rather than any one person. But then it changes by the 1950s and the 1960s when they are actively working for Mother Seton's cause for canonization. And then because they want to promote their foundress, they want to make sure that all of their works are like put onto her CV. You know, it's part of her portfolio that they're gathering to take to Rome to say, no, no, it's not us. Mother Seton is responsible for this. And so her, her picture is there on the booklet. Um, they renamed the Ward Building, which was the building that cared for the poor. They renamed that in her honor. Um, I do not know whether there would have been images or statues of her in the hospital itself. You know, the, the archival record doesn't give me, you know, sort of photographs of the interiors. Um, but it probably, in, it probably wasn't until she was declared venerable and that the, the Vatican sort of made it possible for her, her uh, for devotion to her to be popularized that she would have popped up more and more. So part of it is just the, the internal dynamics of the way a women's religious community operated during the, the earlier period and then the particular sort of um, efforts that were being made to promote her cause for canonization. Then it's Seton everywhere. So there is an agenda here. There was an agenda. And I say this in a loving way. 
Right, right. That, nothing sinister. You know, they weren't yeah. trying to sort of, uh, you know, push her aside or anything like that. There also would have been, and, and part of it too, for the earlier history, and this is getting into perhaps some internal church dynamics, the Sisters of Charity of New York split from the Emmitsburg community. And the Emmitsburg community connected with, with France and became the Daughters of Charity. So even though the Sisters of Charity in New York claimed their history as part of Mother Seton's um, community, they founded their, the, the order. Um, there might have been a little bit of distancing and promoting it the early history of the hospital as something being done by the Sisters of Charity of New York, as opposed to the Daughters of Charity in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. I'm just looking at a comment um, that St. Vincent's Hospital is repeatedly mentioned in the television series, Blue Bloods, uh, which is not one that I watched. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I'll have to sort of take a peek. Oh, okay. It's uh, Mark Anthony, I think, or no? Uh, Jack Kelly. Oh, Jack Kelly, okay, okay. Okay, excellent then. So Giselle, do we want to conclude then? Uh, yes. Because we have another event, actually, if people do not, they can keep their questions, you know, and questions might keep coming uh, because we have another wonderful event, you know, that we are looking so much uh, forward to uh, on April the 20th, 530. Um, and the topic of that event is Elizabeth Ann Seton, the most American saint. It's an interrogative mark. So uh, please join us for this final event in celebration, uh, celebrating actually the legacy of Mother Seton. Okay, wonderful papers. And uh, I'm very grateful for your time. I know, you know, because the weather is so wonderful today, but it means that we, we got around 35 people, you know, uh, attending. So uh, really this topic is very dear to our uh, hearts and minds, Mother Seton. So uh, thank you for, for attending. Thank, thank you for this wonderful paper. It's, uh, with, it's the students and faculty, you know, who make Seton Hall, Seton Hall, right? Following in the footsteps of Mother Seton. Um, I thank uh, Robert, uh, Mr. Robert Budelman for always coming to our events. Thank you, Bob, uh, and for making time for this. And we are also grateful to the administration. The provost has been very involved, you know, with uh, with um, uh, with these events, and also the board of regents and trustees. So thank you. Uh, now I will uh, uh, invite Father Carlos. Father Carlos, are you there? He posted in the chat, Doctor Musaku, that he had a meeting. Oh, he had a meeting. Okay, then. Um, thank you. And I will see you again to, to conclude this, uh, this wonderful event. If sister can say a final prayer, that would be fine. Uh, sister, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, if you can say a final prayer for Mother Seton and for this event. Yeah. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you, Lord, for... Um, uh, the get together. Thank you for the sharing of ideas. Thank you for this wonderful institution uh, that keeps the heritage and uh, uh, the memory of Mother sitting in life and presenting it to the world. Uh, bless everybody who has contributed to the success of these presentations. And uh, we ask you to uh, keep us safe uh, from the pandemic and from all evil. Uh, all this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go and enjoy the day then. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Again, bye now. Bye. 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 bye.